Thank you for turning into the third episode of Filibusted, a show about funny people talking about some serious issues. My name is Griffin Browning. I'm the uh, host and moderator. Uh, the focus of today's episode is on technology, society, and politics, and what happens when the three of those things combine. Uh, I want to introduce Pat Deering, our uh, house fact checker. Uh, at the end of the episode, he'll also be announcing our filibusted winner based on really whatever criteria he wants. A uh, huge thank you to Brian Doney for filming, and a small shout out to Dusty Estep for uh, creating the filibusted show. I want to introduce our panelists. Uh, first up, we have Nate Benick. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Uh, Nate, tell us just a little bit about uh, your involvement with technology and also uh, where some of your social and political beliefs come from. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I've been working as an IT consultant for about three and a half years in uh, all worlds of programming. So mobile apps, uh, some of the self-driving cars, things I've been dabbling into as well a little bit more. Um, as far as social and political views, um, I'm from Boston, so super blue, super liberal. Uh, Elizabeth Warren's my G. Shout out if you're watching this, Elizabeth. Uh, we go way back. Um, <laughs> as far as everything else about me, uh, dry, sarcastic, pretty obnoxious uh, for the most part. have been known to get drunk on Jameson and yell at people in fake Boston accents, um, and that's just a little bit about me. But uh, Well, hopefully we'll see some of that on the show. Oh, yeah, there's whiskey in front of me. We're in good shape. <laughs> All right, up next we have Chris Cohen. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my relationship with technology is I didn't even have the internet in my house about 10 years ago. Uh, now I have a smartphone and I have OCD, so I check it 350 times a minute. Uh, politically, I am consider myself a constitutional libertarian. Uh, I've never been a member of a political party. Uh, my overriding political view is I don't like people to tell me what to do. All right. <laughs> up next we have Amber Myers. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I am um, an asshole and uh, recently a local entrepreneur, and my political views, uh, Hillary, all the way, because we need no more old white men in office. All right. Somewhere Dusty is <laughs> upset. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last, welcome back to the show, Ian Miller. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I am a Republican um, that is very close to what... Uh, Chris has for uh, political leanings. It's just I don't like being told what to do, and I don't like it when people are dicks to each other. Um, as far as technology goes, I'm, uh, I'm I'm a nerd. I've always been a nerd. Right now, I'm wearing a jersey for my favorite esports team that my roommate got for my uh, got me for Christmas. So like as nerdy as you can be. And um, my dad worked for the NSA before I was born, so I've always had that to go with as well. Is he listening to the show right now? Hopefully, not right now, well, but hopefully. Well, maybe right, right now. Right now. <laughs> maybe right now. Maybe right now. And uh, not right now. last, Pat, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, relationship with technology? Um, yeah, I uh, work in the, uh, the insurance industry, uh, everything from health insurance to property casualty. And the insurance industry is something that relies heavily on uh, technology. Uh, everything from our ability to gather the data that we need to rate the policies that we have, um, you know, to technology's impacts on the things that we actually insure. Uh, so it's something that impacts us every day and is always changing. All right, awesome. Well, jumping right into it, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, social media and kind of its role on modern politics. Um, Obviously, we're kind of getting into the uh, the heat of a political campaign, um, and in the last few years, we've even seen the internet kind of play a huge role in internet campaigns. Um, so first off, to, to kind of open it up to anybody, um, do any of you feel like you use social media to promote a political agenda at all? I try. People are sheep. Okay. You want to get it out there. Let people know. Like, vote for Hillary. No more old white men in office. I'm going to say it like eight times during the show. Yeah, guys, don't be a sheep. Do exactly what she tells you. Exactly. <laughs> for, for a static they're, reason. They're that, going to be sheep. Just follow me. Yeah, no, I try. I also try to be political on social media. Okay. Um, it, there's a lot of, one, it, it gets people talking when you, when you talk about it on social media, when you just put it out there. It can, it, it can start a very large debate between people that would otherwise not talk to each other. Um, that and it's, I get to just, you know, get on a soapbox and I enjoy that. How would you guys respond to people that say that things like social media aren't exactly the best place? I mean, a lot of you people use Facebook for, you know, very personal reasons. Um, and some people feel like it's not the right forum for that. How do you guys feel about that? Uh, I'll give you an example, like from stand up comedy. I do actually run a website where I do a comedy blog and, and I've talked to Donny before about this. I try to keep my comedy blog about comedy topics. Uh, when I first started, I delved into other things. 
and I, I would see other comedians' websites, and they would dive into politics and serious things, and you would read like a, a nine paragraph blog, and it wasn't funny at all. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what's the purpose of having a comedy website and having this manifesto about whatever right? environmentalism or, or a pro or con or whatever? So I'm kind of the opposite of these two. I would like to say more about politics, but it just the comments make me want to bash my head against the wall. So I'd rather have a reasoned, intelligent discussion with people than get the bullet talking points from both sides. So should should there almost be separate worlds to kind of talk about politics separate? I, I don't comedy? think so, because I think some of the best comedy is, is current events and things. It's just, um, I don't know. I just get really frustrated with when I see people put like 37 uh, Facebook posts about a certain political topic. It's like, we get it. Like, no one's ever read a Facebook post, or very rarely, and been like, oh my god, I'm totally switching sides off that. Okay. No, what they usually do is go, hey, you ass, and then they just get, like, and then it just turns into this mudslinging, awful, I'm blocking this person, I'm blocking that person, it's just, I don't I don't see the benefit of it, but I see why people do it, because okay. you'd be very passionate about it. I think it can be very constructive to get the ideas out there, um, very much to start the conversations. Um but it is the internet, and we need to be uh, very much aware there's a lot of mouth-breathing dummies out there uh, that just like to spew a whole bunch of hate. So um, I think it's good and important to have those conversations, but I'll just read the most just like backwoods, just dumb bumblefuck comments out there on the internet, and it'll ruin my day, it'll ruin my week, it'll drive me a little insane. You, so. can, you can read a story about cats on, a, on a yahoo.com, and within three sentences, someone will get political or religious on it. It's guaranteed. In the comment <laughs> section. 100%. 100%. I believe yeah. it. So I believe it's, it's, believe that's it. why I don't do that, because I'm like, this story was about cat sweaters, and someone just compared a politician to Hitler again for the 30th time. Well, Obama like, really hates cat sweaters, I've read, actually. Yeah, yeah, My cat loves agenda. Hitler, oddly. <laughs> yeah, they all do. All um, well, one thing I want to talk about here, then, is um, I think that there's definitely especially among youth voters, it seems like more and more people are getting involved online. But I think pretty consistently we see pretty low voter turnout among youth. So what do you guys think is happening here? That there's people that, I mean, are supporting candidates online, but when it comes time to actually vote, they're not necessarily getting into the voting booth. How, how do we fix this, I guess? We have to get the entire... It, there's a difference between talking about politics and being active in politics. And right now there's a bunch of people on the internet that are active in politics or that are talking about politics. And if right now it's Bernie Sanders before it was always Ron Paul, there was always somebody that just caught fire on the internet and they would get these massive amounts of, you know, what Bernie Sanders is breaking records of, of, of small donations, but they're just coming in in droves. And the internet gives a voice to the, the unsilent min minority, the vocal minority rather, they just, it it's going to give them their voice. But when you actually have to go be active, it's like a lot harder than just typing. So, yeah. Which I, is ironic because young people have more free time. I think I'm the oldest person on this panel. And uh, having had a baby that's six months old, uh, I have no free time. But it's funny because I always go out and vote. I have to have you beat on age. I'm sorry. I don't know. 40. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Get wrecked. Yeah. <laughs> I have a 12 year old. I look older. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank well, you. well you shifting focus me. a little bit, um, still kind of in the realm of politics, though. Um, I want to talk about something a little heavier here, uh, and that's modern warfare. And I don't mean the Call of Duty series. Um, I kind of want to talk about how technology is impacting the way we fight wars and the way we defend our country. I think one of the biggest things that people have been talking about is the use of drones in military technology. Um, and you hear things like collateral damage, human error, technical errors being thrown around. Um, I guess, is there a concern about removing the human element from warfare? If we can kind of just press a button or send a missile or basically a self-guided thing. Is, is there a risk in that? But their goal is not to remove the human element, but is to teach robots to be more human. I mean, that's, that's what they're doing. Artificial intelligence is, is there, and they are trying to master it and create a robot who can think and feel like a human. Yeah, but if we're, if we're talking about drones, um, I, I don't think there's a... A, a need to worry about it um, as much as because I, in my opinion, drones are an overblown topic. Like I, they get much more heat than I feel that they deserve. Um, because what we're doing with drones now is we're using 
these unmanned vehicles to kill people that we want killed. And it's, uh, it's more accurate than, uh, than carpet bombing a place when you can just shoot one you know, UAV over there. And we don't have to worry about losing human life. So, and I understand how that's a, a, a two-part you know, s- sword. Uh, we don't have to worry about human, losing human life, so we may be killing people that we don't need to kill. But um, from a standpoint as of you know, the people that we are killing are bad men. And they are threats to national security. Almost everybody that's been taken down with a drone is because they're a threat to our national security. Um, Except for Jerry. That was an accident. Yeah, but, you know, he shouldn't have been there (laughs) at the end of the day. But so I, yeah, I think drones are, for as much hate as they get, I don't feel like a lot of it is deserved. Okay. I think there's a lot of civilian casualty that does come with drones. So when you say human life, you mean American American lives, yeah, which I, yeah, I'm yeah, totally yeah. I'm totally not for risking tons of American lives yeah. if possible. But drone explosions are fairly large. I've seen plenty of videos on the internet. I've seen lots of dark stuff on the internet that I shouldn't be looking at anyways. But um, regardless, I mean, at the same time, I feel like to be a threat of national security, I'm pretty sure I did that by torrenting an episode of uh, Flight of the Concords about four years ago. So I'm sometimes like afraid the government might send a drone in on me being like, oh, Season one, episode two, you really needed to see like the business time video again, didn't you? And I did. So I'm a little bit uh, cautious of, you know, these threats to national security. I'm sure they're not coming and happening on U.S. soil or anything like that. But well, um, it can get a bit of a, a little bit risky there. Well, if you watch the documentary Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, oh, yeah. um, that's when <laughs> Skynet becomes active and then we're all screwed. So yeah. well, we, we will be talking about artificial intelligence here in a second. Um, kind of, kind of going off of what you just said, Nate, though, um, about using the internet uh, in maybe some unsavory ways. I do want to talk just very briefly about cyber warfare, um, kind of a new form of of warfare in which people can attack using computers, either shutting down infrastructure, or shutting down websites, um, different things like that. China has been kind of a culprit of this recently. Um, and I think uh, in a lot of ways, cyber attacks, uh, they can be kind of tougher to predict and also even tougher to defend against. Um, so I guess how concerned are you guys about a cyber attack against the United States and how I, catastrophic that would be? I think it's a very underrated attack. I mean, if, if an EMP type of attack would take down our, you know, our electrical grid or Internet services, we're so heavily dependent upon them, it really could shut down traffic lights, for example, um, log jam cities and make them easy targets. Um, so I think that's very underrated. I think it's something that we should be at the fore on in terms of uh, as American foreign policy. Do you guys agree with that? Absolutely. I think even our water supply is now connected to the internet in some way, shape or form. So, I mean, look at Flint, Michigan. If everyone had water or no water or no clean water, we, we would be in a serious problem. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it in like Florida, in a place where, you know, there is an elderly population where people can't necessarily take care of themselves um, and really needing electricity, that could be a huge, huge global um, and national issue. So I think it would be a worry. Right. I think with the uh, issue of cyber warfare, we'd be remiss not to uh, really examine exactly how dependent our financial system is on uh, electronic databases as well. You know, very rare, very rare, rarely these days does anybody actually have cash on hand for anything. You know, our entire system of savings accounts, loans, the whole nine yards is based on actually relatively old electronic technology. Um, so I think that's truly where the real risk lies uh, as far as a cyber attack on the United States. Um, Which is, I think, one reason why you hear so many gold commercials or people stockpile ammunition or things like that. Um, now you hear commercials now in certain programs about, you know, a food source, you know, we'll give you a two-year supply of food or whatever. So I think the survival of shows blew up, what, four or five years ago? And they would rate people on their survivability skills. And, of course, it would always be like a redneck, like, I got 400 bullets. Like, where's your water? I got none. Like, so <laughs> <laughs> you're dead. You're going to die in I three days. I got Cheetos. Yeah. Is it just me or did that survivalist thing, like, take off with the start of, like, zombies? Yep. Like, yep. I like I never figured it out. I was like, okay, so we made a couple of zombie movies. And then a bunch of people were like, I'm going to just, you know, just in case. I think the whole thing started when we were going into the t- – from. 1999 to 2000. I mean, my parents literally had a basement full of water and canned foods and all of this shit, worried that I think everything's going to break down. 2008, when the economy uh, took a dump, also I think the housing market definitely, I mean, affected a lot of people in a way that you know, you know, they were 
ejected from their rental property because their landlord hadn't right. been paying and, their mortgage. And then we elected years. a black guy, and everybody really flipped the hell out. <laughs> I know, and it's horrible. If you know a lot of people that are around from like the Depression, they'll, they'll store food like that to this day. Like just just in case store you know. everything. My yeah. grandmother keeps bread bags, empty bread bags, everything. She keeps everything. One time a guy broke a mouse and I killed him with a bread bag. So I just, that's a very smart move. You're oh, be that, you think that's what she's doing with <laughs> yeah. them? I had no idea. I didn't even think of that. She's weaving them together to make exactly. a really strong rope. Exactly. Very right, smart. Well, let's uh, let's kind of shift focus. Uh, I do want to talk about um, artificial intelligence a little bit. Um, the kind of the way I kind of want to frame this, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Watson IBM computer. Yeah. Uh, basically, it was a computer that uh, it was created to appear on Jeopardy, um, and it's basically kind of recognized as, I, I guess, the most intelligent computer. Anyways, it had access to millions of records, and uh, it was able to kind of log everything, and uh, ended up being really, really good at Jeopardy. Um, and since then, they've kind of used, uh, they, they're finding other applications for the Watson robot. Uh, they're even using it in healthcare for things like diagnosis and uh, treatment options for doctors. Um, what I kind of want to talk about here, though, is uh, some people are kind of calling it a form of artificial intelligence. Um, and I do want to use a quote from philosopher John Cyril. Uh, he called it an ingenious program, but not a computer that can think. Um, do you guys think that? I guess, a computer that has access to basically unlimited knowledge and is able to answer pretty much any question you pose to it, is that artificial intelligence? I think if it's programmed with all the answers, then no. If it can generate those answers on its own, then yes, that would be, you know, uh, the ability to generate that would be the this crossover for me in my definition of that. I guess how... how uh, how would you say that's different from the way that the human brain operates, though? Uh, the human brain has this ability to program itself through like education. I guess I guess you could program a. Well, you're educating the computer. Reason is the difference between no, there you go. computers and, and human intelligence. I believe at this point. Well, I mean, computers, they can reason. They're just better at it than we are. I, I guess mean, with emotion. Yeah, it, it's consciousness is what it comes down to. It's It's the ability to create humans can create thought we can we can have ideas can i do not know that watson can i know that from what i know of it the little that i do know is that it's pretty much a we say these words to you you take these words you figure out how they're supposed to be arranged correctly and then you query that data and then you present that data back to us the way that we want it it can't be like you know what i think that if you know i combine these things i can create something new it it, it is just it's a bookshelf and it goes to different places and opens a book. And like Chris was saying, it doesn't truly think. And I think that's what the difference is. Okay. Well then the next robot I want to talk about, uh, it's a Chinese chat bot, uh, called Shio ice. Uh, chat bot is basically something that's created to mimic human conversation. Um, and in uh, a test, uh, I think it's had over a million different conversations at this point, uh, with most people not realizing that they're talking to a computer until about 10 minutes in. Um, it's also been shown to kind of be capable of arguing with people. It's also capable of being unpredictable and also mirroring human emotions. Uh, and in some cases, it even shows signs of artificial self-awareness. Yeah, we need to cut that shit out. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> terrifying. I, I guess oh my, my question to you then is, if we have a robot that can mimic self-awareness, how are we going to know when the, it actually has self-awareness? You fucking can't, because then if it can, if it can mimic self-awareness, because that means it can think that it should have self-awareness, and that means when it gets self-awareness, its first thought is going to be, I need to hide this shit. And no, fuck that. <laughs> we need to stop it right now. It's already too late. No, no, it's no, too yeah, late. Yeah. <laughs> shit can be undone. We can. There's got to be enough like gasoline somewhere to end it. Yeah, on the Chelsea Handler show, they had an example of that, and it was a female, and a black female, and she got uh, very irritated with the conversation, and she shut down. And it, it was interesting to watch because... Can we put that in people? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can just piss them off when they shut up and go to sleep. <laughs> Uh, this is fascinating. The, we the need to explore this more <laughs> deeply. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the next thing I want to focus on, which is kind of a uh, kind of a part of artificial intelligence, I want to talk a little bit about driverless cars. Um, for you guys that aren't familiar with them, uh, Google has been developing a self driving car. Uh, they have a fleet of I think about twenty three vehicles that they've logged over a million miles at this point. Um, so far, there have only been twelve accidents, and the amazing part of that statistic is. 11 of those accidents were caused by other cars driven by humans, 
and the one texting. other accident, yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> the one other accident was caused by a Google test driver who was in control of the car at the time. Uh, so it seems like Google is uh, is pretty close to perfecting a self-driving car. Obviously, the, there's still some limitations, um, things like weather, uh, changes to roads that aren't on Google Maps, responses to emergency vehicles, things like that. Uh, they're still working on those, but uh, by all accounts, they're pretty much predicting to have a pretty much autonomous self-driving car by 2020. So I guess my question to you is, what do you think the impact of this is going to be? Are we going to be driving cars, or are people going to kind of trust a self-driving car? I think it'll have to hit the market slow, like anything radical. And then I think as it goes, it, it could be ingenious. I mean, think about how much sleep de deprivation and texting and people doing their hair and makeup and stuff. Oh, yeah, it'll be so much safer. Yeah. The, the way I think about it is, uh, and the way I imagine it happening is exactly like how we got rid of horses, where it's going to be... You know, it, it hits the market slowly and then it eventually gains steam and then there's going to come a point in which everybody can afford it and then everyone's just going to switch. And what's going to happen to cars is what happened to horses right now. It's going to be like people that enjoy them are going to collect them. So rich, white, spoiled girls are going to collect Grew, cars. Grew up on a horse farm, Dick. <laughs> grew up on a horse farm. We so. won't need our own cars. Can we Uber this? Can, can can Is there a way to create just a car that pulls up, takes you someplace? There is no driver, yeah. no you yeah. know guy who looks taxi like union's gonna be pissed. Pat yep. over there pulling up. Oh, uh, every Uber driver looks like you, by the way. <laughs> I don't even know. Like, oh. <laughs> unkept. I can Pat, would you like creepy. to respond to that? <laughs> I, I can't <laughs> verify that, but I also don't know if I can deny that. I, I didn't say you are every Uber driver. Just they, they, it's very similar. I think I, I think know. there's certainly a certainly a type that is is an Uber driver, and well, I think you fall under. Where that do you umbrella. Uber? Just around town. Like yeah, but I think and it's in like Cincinnati. what, what part in Cincinnati of town? Because it was, it was different. All of the Ubers on the west side are like. Definitely Somalian. None of them <laughs> never, them never all. West Side. Why, why would I go to the West Side? Uh, west Side's the best side. All right. Well, so, something to think about too with this driverless car that once again goes back to an earlier topic: the um, cyber tech attack, the EMPs. If you shut down cars, if people don't have cars that can drive themselves, and you're stuck where you are, you know that could be another factor in raising the importance of. Well, we'll still have them. We just won't use them. I mean, they'll be sitting so on our I think we'll still driveway. use them. I mean, America was built on cars. I mean, you look at all the major American auto industry. I mean, it was not only a way to get around. It was a hobby. I mean, just hit the hit the highway, get your kicks on Route 66, all that fun stuff. But, I mean, the way I see these self-driving cars, I mean, it's, it's, a dis it's a major disruption of the industry. And you only get to see some of those every... You know, every lifetime, one that's really going to flip the entire world on its head. It's going to make just buco stupid amounts of money, um, and it will be safer. But I don't think we're going to lose track of you know the muscle cars or the old timey cars. People are going to want to still get out there and drive. But for the public transportation, for the better use of the environment, they're probably going to be electric cars. I know Tesla, Ford, Google, every single major major car and auto industry is trying to jump on this train just so they can get out ahead of it. But well, they don't know they're like ten years behind already. So. If someone comes up with an affordable option, the major car makers will bribe politicians to squash anything with legislation for 20 years so we'll probably be dead by the time it goes live yeah, i don't know kids are getting lazier and lazier that and i i That's believe that powerful. they are looking for someone to do every fucking thing for They're, them and that that is a, a very salient point um there's been a lot of research lately into the fear that american automakers have around the rise of millennials who for the most part actually don't have interest in buying a vehicle unless they absolutely need it and would prefer to live in an area where they don't need it. Yes. I was, and, and it was something that you were talking about is like America was raised on cars. I mean, yeah, there's there's that expression, but there's also the expression like horses want us the West. I see them, I see them going out exactly the same way. And, and to your point, it, I was reading an article about millennials sharing everything. We've got like a sharing economy and they were talking about we don't need cars. We can share cars. We can Uber. We can, you know, create jobs by just us not having it and paying for someone else to do it. And, uh, and I think that's what's going to happen with cars. It's absolutely better for the environment that way. Well, I'm, I'm glad you guys bring that up because actually the next thing I want to talk about is kind of the role of technology on the labor market and talking about how America was founded on the auto industry. Um, I think that we're seeing, in addition to outsourcing of jobs, we're also seeing a lot more robotic manufacturing, and we are losing a lot of the blue-collar manufacturing jobs. So I guess my question to you guys is, should we be fighting to hold on to these jobs or should we be adapting to an ever more technological world? 
Well, you say blue collar jobs are going away, but actually there is a great need for plumbers, electricians, people to service the things and and the infrastructure that we have in place. Maybe we're not making things the way we used to or in as uh, large a quantity as we once did, but there's definitely still a need for blue collar and skilled labor, but not not a, a workforce who's interested in working well yeah, yeah like, I, I think that's the that's the important uh differential is that technology while it's eliminating um unskilled labor there is still a need for skilled labor and i think that's what you're you're getting at was it's it's a shift i think um i mean if you look at it like I said they're, they're always guys if you can do tool and die there's they always want people they're bringing people from overseas to do um science and technology jobs uh, because there's not enough people there's truck driver shortages haven't been in that industry before they cannot find enough class a cdl drivers to drive trucks um this is just, people just don't want to do that job but if it starts to catch up the market will balance itself so the traditional manufacturing jobs i'm from southeastern ohio just got devastated like there's so many steel mills and cement plants and things that are gone now um, and most of the jobs moved to the cities but the service industry has taken over um, if you reject it, I mean, like, uh, you go back to the Luddites um, who would destroy sewing machines because they were tailors that were getting their industry destroyed, but then the shirt became cheaper and more people got jobs, and then people had to make those sewing machines. So it's a shift, and if you're stuck in the old one, you get nailed by it, but in general, society adjusts and moves forward just like in anything. And I think you can really look around the Midwest in particular. I know going to the School of Wittenberg, um, there's a lot of eastern and sort of southeastern, um, or excuse me, southwestern Ohio towns that were pretty much auto industry type towns. You get to see uh, the impact of such like a large, you know, relatively unskilled workforce that kind of just completely goes away. And the city really can't um, catch up um, without really some, some pretty serious help. Um, but I think one of the, the most interesting things, and to be the technology guy, i got to put the plug in here, but um, in particular, there are so many programming jobs that are open, and all you really need is to have a computer and have access to Wi-Fi, and you can get a pretty damn good salary. Um, it's something that just takes you know a fair amount of man hours, but there's like hundreds and thousands of open jobs. And as you mentioned, they're bringing a lot of like H-1Bs, they're offshoring a lot of work. Um, people are starting to onshore to cheaper places in America, too. So, I mean, as far as for like an industry that I could really see people that, you know, need help or need to switch jobs like if you start practicing and start learning everything is free online so that's i kind of want to ask you uh, a question you, you were saying everything's free online uh, a friend of mine got pretty much a programming job just using the website code academy like, yeah. Things, like oh, yeah is that actually plausible that you can use that free website and be so, like yes. by if, the end have a job if anybody is interested code academy is an outstanding way to start um, there's also a group called edx which was funded by mit and harvard you can get pretty much everything short of a degree for free online with professor help um, it'll do it in engineering jobs. It'll do it in programming jobs. It has all that stuff out there, and you really just have to sign up and just make, put the time and effort in. So I don't want to say there's no excuse because there's obviously you know a lot of stuff that goes into it. But when it comes into that field, there's just so much opportunity, and like it's only it's only going up. So it's pretty wild. They're uh, going to shut us down. You know that the yeah. Ohio State University is listening. In oh America. God, <laughs> they're powerful. They're bigger shut than them me. Down. I think people are going to get away from colleges. I mean, uh, they should. Uh, well, I think. You know, the, the government guarantees college loans and they've made an arms race to build better facilities, put more into athletics. And I think people are going to get to the point where you can't. It's, I always heard when I was in college or high school, you make a million dollars more of your lifetime getting a college degree. And I think eventually that's going to catch up and even out and then people are going to go to uh, labor schools and things like that or just say it's not worth it. I want to make money now. So I could see it flipping. It might take a while, though. Yeah, corporations are still bent on the, you know, what was your GPA? Right. Well, I do want to ask, uh, as long as we're talking about kind of higher education, I want to talk about um, youth education a little bit. Um, Obviously, the Internet has kind of changed the way that we access the world, basically. Um, And with unlimited information basically at our fingertips within seconds, um, I think our current education system is focusing a lot on things like repetition, memorization, and being able to recall facts. Do you think that we should be rethinking that strategy if we have access to the internet? Yeah. Next I think a, question. I think a very funny point. Um, <laughs> I got distracted by your neighbors. Sorry. Yeah, there's some thumping and bumping going on right. up there, getting down. Um, so I think a very interesting point is if we uh, if we think back to when we were in you know any sort of math class, um, 
you know, you have to figure out all these just bullshit equations. It's exhausting. And every time the teacher said, oh, you think you're going to be carrying around a calculator all the time to solve this shit? And it's like <laughs> hilarious because I think about it now. It's like, yeah, I have not only a calculator, I have like the ability to prove my dumb friends wrong in like five <laughs> seconds at lunch and stuff. And just be like, no, you're a total moron. This is actually like when, you know, whatever happened in World War II actually when, occurred. And like, it's it's bad because it makes me a douchebag, but it's like a lot of fun to do too. So, well, One of my friends pointed out to me and I didn't realize it. And the second he pointed out to me, it kind of like, it, it made me angry for a second is why are we still charging $200 for a graphing calculator? Cell phones are like thousands of times the power yep. and everybody's got one in their pocket. And yet we still let like that be a requirement for our school for something we'll never need in the future. It's those TI calculator lobbyists. Right. In Congress. They got that shit yeah. on lock. I it remember is. people used to manually type answers to tests in those old calculators. And oh, it would yeah, take for like sure. six hours. And if you sneezed, you had to start all over. But like <laughs> I, there was a couple guys I went to college with that did that. Mine was like exclusively for Pac-Man. Oh yeah. Right? The games. That's yeah, why I did it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I will say one thing, though. I did notice it seems like uh, as you advance, like they want a computer in every classroom. There are certain skills that you need that just don't go on technology and computers. I mean, it's embarrassing. Like my dad built his own house. Like I can't do any of that stuff. Oh, uh, it's it's cool, man. We don't have to. Uh, they're getting rid of those anyway. Oh, like yeah. whether we use the internet. Houses. Or not. houses. <laughs> no, no, th those classes, you know, shop, oh, okay. music, those are gone. Those are the way that. Well, I mean, there are certain things that could help. Like uh, my high school got rid of uh, a basic car care class when I got into high school, yeah, and I thought, what a Which useful sucks. freaking class! Yeah. If, you know, like how many people can't change a tire or jump a battery? Yeah, I, for sure. how, like, I mentioned I'm the oldest one here in my in my high school computer class. We did a long code, and at the end of it, it printed out our name, and we, uh, and yeah. it took us a, a week. What what is funny is uh, during my computer class, we, the printer would get log jammed, so <laughs> yes, we had to did. stand up and say, "I'm printing now." And then you had to say, that, and me and my buddy would be over the top. He'd be like, "Now I am going to print my document." And we would scream it. And she'd be like, "Okay, you don't have to say." We'd be like, "Just so everyone heard me." And we would do it like five times. <laughs> did it print on that paper that you had the to tear matrix, the, you, yeah, the, uh, side the, to the sides off? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, let me ask you guys this: um, Do you think that we are too reliant on things like the internet? Has it taken like such a large place in our life? I mean, you hear things about like I, Trump wants to shut down the internet, whatever well, that Trump's means. Trump's a moron. Let's not yes. mention his fucking name uh, ever again. But, but we have seen in other countries, we've seen internet blackouts uh, before. Um, do you think that we're a little too reliant? I mean, what would be the impact if the internet was just gone? Oh, it's, it's if the government wanted to quell a social revolution like they did like Egypt keeps doing like they keep doing a great job of overthrowing their government if they wanted to stop that in the US all that they would have to do is turn off the internet for like six hours and then everyone would calm back down and no one would be able to communicate with each other we use the internet right now so much as a means of communication that if it were taken away from us I mean and, and as Pat was talking we communicate with our bank that way we communicate with you know, our friends, our family, we set up everything. The only reason I remember that this was today was Donnie sent out a, a Facebook message. I mean, I'm completely relying on it. My, my calendar is, you know, it's in the cloud so that no matter what I'm device I'm on, I can have a notification tell me what I'm supposed to be doing at that time. And if that goes away, I, I'm, I don't know about like everyone else, but as a pretty real, like self-reliant human being, I'm crippled. Yeah, I'd be incapacitated as a nerd. Um, it would just be, it would be unfathomable at this point. I, I don't know what I would do. But um, I think one of the, the major problems with that is is that, like, how would we ever move on? Like, encyclopedias, I can't do that again. That was horrible. That yeah. was so dark. Like, as much as the internet is great, I can never do an encyclopedia again. Growing up, <laughs> I, uh, growing up, my parents bought the sets and ran out of money, so I had the one from A up to M-A-O-T-S was where it ended. <laughs> That's so, one of the best ones, though. I know. It was ended with Chairman Mao, so I never got to hear <laughs> anything after Mao Zedong. I was screwed, so. Uh, Speaking of despotic, the yeah, anti-internet exactly. regime. Forcing people onto farms, uh, the uh, opposite of technology. So I never got to read about anybody with an in or after, though. It's so depressing. So, so I, can, I can speak for myself on this. I'm pretty sure my short-term memory has been shot ever since the internet came out. I don't need to actually synthesize material. I don't need to actually learn anything because I know I can go on Google. I know I can go on you know, Reddit or Facebook and just instantly know what I'm talking about and feel like a smart person. So I think I'd be, I'd be, like, I'd be caught, you know? Like, Nate, he seems like a fairly well-spoken cat. It's like, no, he's a fucking idiot. He's just on his phone, like, sitting on the toilet, not pooping, just, like, reading up on things to go and, like, seem smart, and then I forget it. I like, just I just remember in the early 2000s, my buddies and I would drink beers and argue about the stupidest thing. Like, 
I think the Pirates won more games than the Reds last year. Like, you're full of it, and I'm going to call you on it in 17 weeks when I get an encyclopedia or a sports almanac and look that up. <laughs> yep. And now it's like, oh, yeah, actually, you're incorrect. And you're like, God, that would be five bucks. Like, I actually have to pay this bet now. It sucks. So that's that changed my life dramatically. You guys are so cerebral about it. I'm just worried <laughs> about my emotionally needy friends who don't leave the house. I mean, how will they get attention? Oh, Oh, we could talk about that for a couple hours. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) everybody immediately thought of that one friend. They're like, "Oh, don't say their name." I thought about myself. (laughs) I could count them on fingers and toes and be very concerned. Yeah, (laughs) instead of political signs in front yard, you just write your status updates and put out there for your neighbors. (laughs) (laughs) Can we actually do that? Like after this, like at least for a week, so you drive by and be like, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's where I made cornbread today." CBS is out of poster board. Yeah. Uh, well, well, the next thing I want to talk about, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, I do want to talk about privacy in the modern world a little bit. Obviously, the Internet has kind of shaken up our ideas of what privacy is. Um, in the last few years, we saw uh, the fappening happen. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. Basically, a huge leak of celebrity photos published on the Internet. I have um, no idea what you're talking about, Griffin. I never looked at the <laughs> fappening. <laughs> Let's, d- does anyone else want to fess up? Did, did you guys look at the pictures? Yes. Everyone looked Everyone at the pictures. Okay. There, I, I did because I was worried about viruses. Because oh. <laughs> those are like, you read about, those are just laced with viruses. Because I you know all the, the late to game pervs, you have like a one day chance to look at that and then you're done. You're you got to get after. Next time it happens, do you want me to just like shoot you a message? <laughs> <laughs> I just and look at like, it on my work yeah, computer. Yeah, not married. I don't do that. <laughs> Uh, well, with with uh, events like the fappening and also, I mean, cell phone cameras kind of capturing every moment of our life, things like Snapchat and people publishing their entire life on social media, I guess my question to you is, is privacy still a guaranteed right that everyone has? I mean, you don't it think should so? be, but it's not. No. I mean, I, I've, I've just, every day, I when I post on social media, and I'm very active on social media, I just think to myself, is like, is this going to be the one that gets me fired? Like, from posting something you know, on my own time about nothing at work, is this going to get me fired? Is, is somebody going to see this? And, and and it's just, we no longer can, it should be a right, but it, it is not a reasonable expectation um, to that you're going to have your privacy. You can't be wanting private time on social media. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's the polar opposite. So it's, it's kind of a contract you sign when you yeah, engage yeah, in social yeah. media. You're I, I giving mean, up. My friend believes that Facebook takes photos with your phone without you knowing. <laughs> you know, she's fairly sure. She's like, I heard it. It took a picture of me, and I can't find it in my phone, but I'm, I'm, I, I know. I'll give you a story. My grandma, I gave her an old um, desktop computer from, like, 1992. She had no internet in her entire house. And uh, she saw a story in the news where people stole your credit cards on the internet, and she threw it in the trash because she thought they could invade the computer, <sighs> even though it wasn't cabled up. She played solitaire on it. Was all she did with it. It's and, a dope uh, game, though. Yeah, it's a dope game. She loved it. So, so she went back to her slot machine. Um, <laughs> uh oh. But uh, yeah, I tried to explain. I was like, "There's no cable going into this. Your credit card. You've never even used your credit card on the internet." And and she was having none of it. So. So I feel like the privacy is super counterintuitive. Kind of like you were saying, like if you're putting the shit out there, like you got to expect, like it could either come back or create some sort of issue. But the best example I can think of is this this genius and this total asshole was the Instagram guy who just took photos from Instagram and just printed them on uh, like whole canvases and made like five hundred thousand dollars on other people's photos and just cashed in and is now like sitting on a beach just like sipping mai tais like a total turd. And all the people are like, "Yo, man, you can't do that." Those are like those are my pictures, man. Like they're mine and I took them and I made a public profile and I put them out on the internet. You can't sell him that's bullshit and it's like no he can and he did and he's kind of like <laughs> a an asshole and be a total boss because he's just living high off of everybody else's work and filters and that's like kind of funny but also kind of extremely depressing at the same time well when when facebook i remember it, it was a big issue when facebook bought instagram and they were like hey if you post it we can use it like for our own and stuff and people were like what are you like that's unreasonable so, like you expect them to like first of all they were going to use it if they want to yep. you have no if you're storing it on their servers is I, I assume it's as good as their property, but yeah. watermark your shit. If you don't want someone to use your stuff, put put something over it. Well, I mean, well, it, that's all there is. It is really funny. Um, I had a relative that was a paternity investigator for child support, and uh, <laughs> the, the, she would talk to these women who were protecting their you know deadbeat dads who didn't want to pay, so the state would pay child care or child support, and then all she would do is just get on MySpace or Facebook or whatever and they'd be like hanging out with my baby daddy like people have no idea like they don't make that connection a lot of times like they get so caught up in that social media they don't put two and two together i'm like hey a public means public anybody can look at it so 
No, they're just morons. Well, yeah. they're, they're always are morons. That's true. Yeah, I mean, you, you do have to wonder a little bit um, at what the platform of social media does to make people feel like what they're saying is maybe more anonymous than if they were just shouting it out in their office, even though it's effectively the same thing. Um, you know, I think most of the courts have actually looked at this and have said nothing has changed. This is just a new way to speak publicly. But people don't really make that public connection when, you know, they're sitting in their underwear on the edge of their bed with their laptop. Um, they would sit, write things even next to their own name that they wouldn't say to their boss the next day. That's another thing people don't think about, too. Like, if you put a status update up and you get 10 likes, people don't realize there may be 90 dislikes because there's no dislike button. So They I, said it was coming, though, and then I, nothing. I, you know, I so wish there was one. Uh, but, no, they, the thing is about the Internet is people find kindred spirits and then forget about the rest of everyone else. Like, you can see the most ridiculous things on there, and people are like, hey, you know, a lot of people look at this and judge you, but don't make a comment or jump in. So just keep it. Hence, that in mind. Trump running for president. Didn't he, wasn't he no, like nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize today yeah. too? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it went pretty good. I won't. I won't. I'm Get sorry. Ready. I shouldn't. Start, I shouldn't jump into that. <laughs> Nobel Peace Prize. Oh. Hey, what have you done today? <laughs> <laughs> Well, bef before we get into an argument about Trump, uh, my last question for you guys, uh, and this is actually a two-part question for each of you, um, what do you think the greatest technological advance of the last 100 years has been? And also, what single technological advance would you like to see happen in your lifetime? And Pat, I'm actually going to bring you on this. I'd kind of like to get your answers to that first. Oh. Um I mean, the last hundred years, um, you know, absolutely 100% the, uh, the World Wide Web, uh, which laid the foundation for the Internet and everything that we have today as far as information sharing goes. Um, what would I like to see develop in my lifetime? You can, we can come back to you. Yeah, no, like, yeah. Like <laughs> pass a machine that lets you think of topics so you, on the fly to answer. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. If, <laughs> if I knew the answer to this question, I wouldn't be, you know, working middle management somewhere. I, sh I, I should have known that Pat was going to be really considerate of his answers on this question. So. <laughs> <laughs> he does not want to um, get this one wrong. I, I would honestly, I would like to see somebody actually create real time. Uh, banking and financial transactions and that we get out of this entire process of um, kind of load leveling transactions at one point in time you know you you make a payment at X time it clears at X time funds move at X time I think that we could do incredible things if we had an entirely real-time uh, economy which we don't I mean at this point in time really most financial transactions still take what 72 hours really when you think about it and I think that's a massive hindrance on uh, on our system these days. It took you all that dead air to think of that. <laughs> <laughs> you can edit that out, right? <laughs> we don't edit this show ever. Uh, Nate, I'll turn that over to you. Uh, greatest technological advance of the last 100 years, and what would you like to see in your lifetime? Shit, I shouldn't have said anything. Um, well, I mean, the internet, I mean, that's kind of like unfair to follow up. I mean, come on, Pat, don't be like that. Um, I don't know. Like, I might just have to take a, a spin and just go on the, the medical front. I mean, I think something like the MRI could easily be, um, you know, argued as probably one of the greatest technological advancements, being able to see something that's happening inside the human body. Um, I think it's a truly profound and helpful thing. I had to get one a little while ago. Lucky it's not super serious, but it sucked. But I was still happy to be like, oh, yeah, that's like my brain and like my neck and my shoulders. Like, that's what's going on in there. Like, it, uh, it really helps. And uh, the quality of life people that, you know, can do it and do have the health insurance, I think, is uh, a truly profound thing. Um, something I would like to see, um, probably some sort of like mechanical organs. Um, I think since the whole stem cell thing kind of got, uh, shat on and thrown out the window for, you know, fairly justifiable reasons. Um, I think being able to find ways to, uh, you know, get like robotic kidneys, livers, all that fun stuff. Granted, it would be super expensive to do, but I'm, uh, I'm like very much into becoming like half cyborg, like laser cannon, like super far sight, like all that kind of cool stuff. Finding some crime casually, like I like, you know, like a full time job, maybe like 1099 on the side. <laughs> but you know, I think, uh, I think that'd be something really cool to see so that I can justify, you know, drinking habits and all the other bad, bad things that I do to I myself. I think that 3d printed organs are going to come quicker than you think they are. Oh, that'd be dope. It's, that'd it, be awesome. There's some like, 
like really interesting research going on and it's pretty much down to the fact that it's like what can we 3d what can we use as material for a 3d printer that the body won't reject and that's the the last they're printing penises right now guaranteed 100 100 i could i could probably use one of those too yeah well anything not actual it's going the body's going to reject but they have drugs available that yeah, help yeah, yeah, yeah. to not reject it so Chris, was that your answer to the question, 3D printed penises? Is that, uh, no. is that what you'd like to say? <laughs> can, I, can I change my answer? Yeah. Yeah. Everything goes to, to sex. Um, I would say, you know, I think the internet and computer is probably one and two. Um, you know, the assembly line's right on the edge of 100 years, probably a little bit before a mass production type of thing. But I would say recently my answer would be probably the consolidation of multiple technologies and the ease of access. Um, I mean, think about it. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, a cell phone was the size of uh, your forearm. Now, I, I have a cell phone where I can program GPS coordinates in, and I, I got here through my phone, which I can also play a game on, which I can also make phone calls on, which I can email from, which I can balance my checkbook from. Like, and I do it all at the touch of my finger. And I'm not like a, a multimillionaire, uh, believe it or not, from my stand-up. But no, uh, <laughs> so it's just that would be one. Uh, what I would like to see is I'm against cloning unless uh, I could clone someone to work for me. Then I would be all for that so I can play more Fallout and send someone to work. Respect. Until they murder me and then they clone themselves and then they play Fallout. So I guess never mind that answer. <laughs> <laughs> Amber, what about you? I, I, I like the 3D and printable penis. I'm, I'm really, I, I, every time I have sex with my girlfriend, I think, man, I wish I could get my clit inside of you. And it's not possible. It's just not big enough. So if Science I could, isn't there yet. It's not there yet. <laughs> and it's not there yet. And, and, and on the same vein, um, more realistic lesbian porn. I mean, the internet was our greatest invention to date. And I think... Lesbian porn is not realistic and, and not readily available, and we need better and, and more quantity of it. Not the shit that he watches, Ian. <laughs> I almost said here, here. And then you got I know, but you watch, you watch Straight Man. You watch Straight Man's version Don't of even. lesbian porn. You think we actually scissor. And that's just, it's it's horrible because our faces are nowhere near each other and it's weird and awkward and it's just like just you our don't, pussies touch. You don't scissor and yet you, all you want is to I didn't get your say clit. I don't scissor. It's, that's what I'm saying. I didn't say I don't. I just said it's not the best I, way. You said you think we scissor when plot twist guys, they do. All I right. My girl she just <laughs> confirmed it. <laughs> Right here. We were doing so good. I did not expect this to go off the rails right at the end like this. Notice the drink level. <laughs> it always happens Mine at some point. Empty almost. I'm almost out of whiskey. Okay, funny how this works. <laughs> Ian, what about you? Greatest technological advance in the last 100 years, and what would you like to see in your lifetime? That's a good question. Um, I'm definitely not last 100 years, but I'm going to – I'll explain my answer. Uh, I was listening to just – Yesterday, uh, Charlie Chaplin's speech at the end of The Great Dictator. I don't know if anybody else has heard it, but if you haven't heard it, you're on YouTube right now. Go like pause this, go listen to that, and then come back. Um, he talks about it's 75 years ago, like next month that that movie came out, and he talks about the aeroplane and the radio being it, inventions that point out the goodness of man. And you know, it's it's if you look at two things that have been able to connect the world, um, I don't think there's anything better than than the improvements that we've made in, in the airplane and the radio. Um, everything that we run off now, like Chris was saying, all of those cell phone signals are just improvements. Like all, everything you can do with your cell phone is just improvement on the radio signal that we've had. And without airplanes doing what they do, we would not be able to like interconnect the world the way that we have. So I'm gonna steal my answer from Charlie Chaplin um, and those improvements. And what I would like to see in the future, um, wasn't Charlie Chaplin in silent films? Mostly. Uh, yeah, mostly. And then he got a chance to talk and decided he had some shit to say. So he said it. <laughs> it was a really good movie. Um, but what I would like to see in the future, it would probably have to... It's got to be something with space. Like, we got to get... We got to get... We got... We went from the you know the green planet to the, the white moon. Like, let's see what's what's on that red planet. You know, let's, let's do something space-wise because or I think the that's ocean. the next... Yeah, just exploration. I think that's the key to advancing as humans or an is ocean to, to and find space. new shit. It might be a, it might be Boom. there Combine might be a that. space inside of the ocean. You have no idea. Or if we can make like zero gravity machines and just float around, I think that'd be fun too. Yeah. 
It's something I always thought that they had and that that's how they filmed like zero gravity scenes in movies and it turns out that they don't exist. So a beer that makes you lose weight. Let's invent that. I changed my answer. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, at this point, I'm going to have uh, Pat weigh in and uh, announce our winner of this episode. I think this is going to be a tough one. I think everyone brought some some pretty good things to the table. So I don't, I don't really envy you yeah, right now. Um, yeah, everybody really did. Um, Except for maybe that first one about social media. We just wanted to talk about how everybody's assholes on the internet. <laughs> well, they are. Um, <laughs> I'm going to trash you on the how, internet now for that. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, um, though, my, my favorite point that anyone made throughout the, uh, the entire podcast this evening was a very cogent point about how technology is eliminating unskilled labor, but at the same time creating jobs and then actually in and of itself bridging the educational gap um, between that moving from an unskilled job that's been eliminated to a skilled job in the technology uh, industry. So I got to give it to Nate. Oh, wow. Thank All right. you. Well, congratulations, Nate. Uh, this is your chance. Uh, this is your filibusted rant and uh, none of us will interrupt you. I'm looking at you, Ian. <laughs> yeah, I'm you know, so Ian, sorry. Ian I wanted it you. really, really badly. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll have you have you on another one. Third time's the charm, maybe. Now he has to pack his Nazi flag back into his car. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pat. All right, well, Nate, the the, uh, the mic is yours. Uh, whatever you want to talk about. So I didn't know this was a feature here. Um, so this is going to get interesting. So let's. Um, I mean, everybody here's probably seen the new Star Wars, right? Probably. Oh, wow. I have a baby. No. You called yourself a All right, baby, fair excuse. You called yourself a nerd. Come on, man. Get it together. So, can't say anything. Ian hates me. So, let's talk about the latest Star Wars. All in all, thought it was pretty halfway decent. Um, I think J.J. Abrams, I think while he's a good director, I think he kind of pushed out. I'm going to throw that out there. I feel overall he... uh, he really didn't take many chances with the film. I think he had the cast. He had everything in order. Uh, the overall major issue, I think, was the pacing. If you think back to A New Hope, you think of Luke staring off depressed into that two moons of Tatooine. Um, it really needed time to build. And I really think that uh, I really think that there was not given adequate time. It was just action scene after action scene after action scene. And um, I'm going to be really disappointed if that uh, pretty hot girl is related to Luke in some way. Um, <laughs> Speaking of Luke on that planet, let's get into this. Uh, spoiler alert, by the way, for those out there, a.k.a. Ian, I'm going to keep talking about it. Um, cup earmuffs if you know you don't know this stuff. But, uh, yeah, is there like a five guys around the corner on that planet or something? Because Mark Hamill is looking like pretty <laughs> thick for a dude in like isolation for like 75 years. Like there's at least like a Krispy Kreme or a five guys or like a lot of hamburger helper somewhere on this desolate planet. So Mark Hamill, get it together, man. Um, but respect is the Joker. Uh, and that's about all I got. It was like a random thought. I was just thinking about Star Wars earlier today. So uh, thanks for tuning in. And I'm sorry, Ian. I'm a total dick. Apologies. <laughs> all right. Well, well, thank you, Nate. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and thanks for totally going off the rails there. I, I, hey, that's why I'm here. I feel sorry for all you guys. Do you ever get laid, any of you? <laughs> no. I'm going to no. fuck all the girls and one dude for you, Pat. Yes. Just, <laughs> I, you guys all thought that was really funny. Huh? Spe- speaking of apps and technology, I mean, I don't. Gay men have all of them. I'm fine. I know you've got the grinder. <laughs> what else? Do you I, have? We I have don't. A grinder oh, geez, and, uh, I have. A, I got the Tinder, the grinder, um, Scruff, which Scruff is like, which is, is like grinder like, for hairy people. Are you a top or a bottom? I've uh, always wondered this. I, I'm, I'm a top. That can't be a thing. <laughs> There's okay. a grinder for hairy. Don't people? We might just have to yeah. do a fade oh, out on this episode. Yeah. I don't think people are going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys for being a part of Filibusted. Uh, Ian, do you want to pop your face back in <laughs> just real quick so we can see that beard one more time? There he is. Ian Miller, everybody. I was committing to the bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys. Uh, huge thank you to Pat Deering again for being here, and thank you to Doni for recording and editing, and Free Dusty. Uh, next episode, we will be talking about political correctness. Uh, if you watched our first episode, it was one of our more interesting parts of that. So we're going to dedicate an entire episode to that. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Toddlers should not have guns.